here in Houston, Texas. As you know, immigration is federal, so we represent individuals anywhere in the US and the world on US immigration matters. Um, I also wrote a book about law practice management for fellow practitioners, and um, I've done a lot of work in advocacy. So let's move on. So, you know, what is a prosecutorial discretion? How does it work? And then we're also going to mention this new memo that just came out um, and what priority and non priority cases are. And um, so let's go ahead and, and dive in. And let me bring out my copy so I have it close to me as we discuss. So, prosecutorial discretion has existed for a really long, long time. It's just that as to what memo and in what was the guiding light as to what um, the trial attorneys, OPLA, um, can actually, what they're allowed to do, the OPLA stands for the Office of Principal Legal Advisor, um, can depend on which memo is in force and, and takes um, at the time. And, and so for as long as I've been practicing, I hadn't seen as much focus on prosecutorial discretion as I am in the last less than a year. And so this is a good time for those who are in court and who want to get out of it without having to have their case adjudicated by an immigration judge. So it's a longstanding authority of law enforcement agency to charge to decide where to focus its resources and whether or how to enforce the law against an individual. It allows OPLA, which we mentioned, is the um, Office of uh, principal legal advisor attorneys to decide which cases to focus on and how they want to proceed, such as agreeing to remove the case from the docket through dismissal. Dismissal really means getting the case terminated, if you will, not in court at all. Administrative closure means there's no future hearing dates, but at any point, the OPLA, the, the client, or the immigration judge could reopen. So it sort of still exists somewhere, but uh, it doesn't have a future hearing date. The main reason why people like to get administrative closure is that they could renew their work authorization based off of asylum or cancellation of removal or whatever, a form of relief that if they allowed can work authorization um, at the time. Um, it also could ask to, to agree to stipulations on issues such as relief, bond, continuances, um, and it's, is a, it's an authority exercised by immigration officers on a case-by-case -case basis and does not create a right or entitlement. Okay, so it's basically allowing the OPA attorneys to work together to, to, to move some cases along and get off of the 1.7 million, now we're at 1.7 million court cases that are now before the immigration judges. Um, there's approximately 500-ish immigration judges and there's an attempt to almost double the, the amount of judges on the bench in the next year. Um, so between trying to um, reduce the amount of cases that are in court and by having speeding up the processing with um, almost doubling the immigration judge court bench, um, the really hoping focus to, to be able to, to move through these, these cases that have, there are some cases that have been pending for nearly 10, 15 years. So um, how does it work? Well, basically, OPA attorneys will independently evaluate the case to determine whether to exercise it. Uh, the PD, uh, your legal representative, so i.e. attorney, um, can submit requests. And then they will first evaluate whether it's a the person is an enforcement priority, um, and and if they make the priority designation, they um, they'll review all the available information, weighing all the the factors, mitigating and aggravating, consistent with the legal obligation. Okay, so what does that really mean? If you don't have an attorney, what you could do is you could find out what's the OPLA email for PD requests for where your court case is at. Um, it's, I looked it up the other day. It was pretty easy to find actually. Um, and, and then you can send a request. It could be like a, a little bit of like a one pager of saying, um, I'd like for the case to be dismissed, administratively closed, or ask if you would a grant or stipulate to X, Y, Z. And then, and then you say, and this is why, here's all the proof of why um, you have something else that you could do, uh, you have a good case to merit these stipulations, what have you. So you request um, by sending a package via email, 
and very bullet points, very simple language, if you will, because the officers, the, the attorneys are reviewing lots and lots and lots of these. Uh, when we first did these back in like the summer, we had like briefs and packages. It was like really big. And then now we realize, um, and I was at a conference this weekend in El Paso, we heard directly from OPA advisors. They really wanted to keep it simple and just be as persuasive and get to the point. And so we, we completely get that. Um, so it could just be bullet points, what you're asking for, why you you're deserve it, and your proof to, to um, that extent. Um, so then once you submit that, then usually you get an email, can work differently in different jurisdictions, and they'll say, I'm in charge of your PD request. Okay, great, thanks. And they say, if we don't hear back from me in certain time, follow up with me. And so, okay, or maybe you don't hear anything, but it's somewhere in queue. Um, now, if you've got a hearing really soon, then you're going to want to get uh, to push that PD request. Now, just out as a courtesy, you don't, which is the title of this presentation, you don't want to wait till the last minute because you might be pushing it too close to a merits hearing um, in which the judge has a you know one, two, three hour block on their calendar. And by putting uh, this pressure on the OPAL attorneys, uh, to make a decision, it's it's going to be very difficult for that uh, decision potentially to be made timely, and you might have to ask for continuance, and you may or may not get it, uh, depending on when you filed your PD request. So that's really the gist of why you don't want to wait too long, um, because all of the uh, all of the PD memos, I think we're up to like three or four of them right now um, since last summer. They it's caused more and more individuals to be requesting PD, and therefore it's causing more of a backlog, which is great that people are filing for these wonderful. Uh, it's just that, you know, really it does take a lot of work as a practitioner myself to be able to get these filed. So you, you submit it, whether on your own or with an attorney, um, and then you wait. And then if you haven't heard back in a certain amount of time, like let's say maybe a month and a half, then you might want to send a little nice nudge and ask, hey, how's it going and anything else? Now, if the trial attorney ever sends you a request for, can you give me this document? Can you this document? The best thing is to give it to them as soon as possible. Now, in the end, what could happen is they could say, yes, we agree with you. We want, we're willing to dismiss it. Why don't you fill out this joint motion to dismiss? So then um, I've done that before and I fill it out. We both sign and we, one of us mails it to the court and we wait for the judge to approve it or review it. The other possibility could be to admin close and then there could be a joint motion to admin close. Or if they say, yes, we stipulate to what have you, then we also could, um, make sure that that happens by the time we go to court we've already we announced that to the judge at the beginning say we've already agreed on these issues and so today we're going to focus on the whatever's left um so all that being said it takes time because even in our firm we have to review the case we have to strategize then we talk to the client and we have to think about what if was that included in the contract and then we move forward and then we submit it then we follow up and then we wait for a result and then depending on the result, then we, we proceed further. So the whole process can take a while. And I understand why a lot, we're not trying to do it at the last minute, but sometimes it might look like that, but we're not. So on, um, it was actually April 3rd. Um, so it was, it's all happened this recently. The principal legal advisor, Carrie E. Doyle issued a memo to the OPA workforce titled guidance to OPA attorneys regarding the civil uh, immigration laws and the exercise of prosecutorial discretion. And it is 17 pages, 17 pages. Um, and so it will take effect April 25th. Um, now that's just right around the corner. Uh, so the best thing to do is to internalize it and start preparing. And even if you were to file this PD request uh, before, it probably won't be adjudicated until after April 25th. So you might as well uh, get it going. And maybe if you do submit it, say, you know, which uh, pursuant to this memo, which will take effect. Now, what this memo says is um, it more or less takes all the other memos um, and then it sort of like gives us more detail and, and expands those and, and gives more guidance, gives more guidance. Um, so, you know, it, it starts off with September 30th, 
uh, Mayorkas, Secretary or Mayorkas issued a memo guidelines to enforcement of civil law, immigration law, and it lays out the DHS civil immigration enforcement priorities to ensure the finite resources are used in a way that accomplishes the department's enforcement mission. And in accordance with that memo, um, the general counsel Meyer titled another uh, memo and uh, ensuring principles of prosecutorial discretion. And then uh, Kelly Doyle, the um, is is also the principal legal advisor, is now giving us even further guidance, taking into account all those other memos um, and ensuring the principles of prosecutorial. She's providing this guidance to ICE officers of the principal legal advisor. We said OPLA assigned to handle proceedings before executive office of immigration. Okay, I'm saying a lot of acronyms, right? But to guide them in appropriately executing the enforcement priorities and prosecutorial exercising prosecutorial discretion. I mean, this is great. We need more guidance, we need more clarity so that people weren't saying, I don't know about that, I don't know that. The, the more wiggle room, the vagueness uh, of, of guidance, then the more people get confused. And, and so this has a lot of more specific details as to what the priorities are. So non-priorities are those um, referred to as non-priority when uh, that will want the output will want to do prosecutorial discretion. And pretty much it's like people who don't have crimes um, and people who have other forms of potential relief. Um, for people who have a lot of ties to the United States with, with family. And, and that's pretty much the gist of it. So priority um, are those more with, um, with more with crimes and a threat to national security. So the three enforcement priorities, they say priority A, threat to national security, B, threat to public safety, and threat to border security. So if an individual, and this new memo goes into a lot more detail, if the individual is a threat to any of those, then they're more of a priority. And, um, and here we go a little bit more in detail. So national security, someone who's engaged in suspected of terrorism, espionage, uh, danger to national security. Um, public safety, so that could be um, poses a threat to public safety. Um, I, I think a lot of times that could be determined if they've done a, have committed a crime or multiple crimes that, that demonstrates that they are um, aggravating factors include the gravity of the offense and conviction, the length and the nature of the sentence imposed. Um, so if they so give some guidance there about like if it was labor exploitation, human trafficking, um, if they if they were in jail, incarcerated for a long time, if it, they're endangering someone um, or a group of people. And then the threat to border security, uh, you know, this one is, let's see, what do they say? Um, applies directly to nine citizens apprehended at the border while attempting to unlawfully enter after November 20, November 1, 2020. Um, in addition to those who enter the US, unlawful entry in this context should be construed to include individuals who apply for admission, but are inadmissible at the time, including due to criminal or an inability to satisfy document really, uh, requirements. So if this looks like this is your type of case uh, that you meet one of these priorities, um, then we, we really should take a look at it and try to see if there's a way uh, you still could be considered for PD. But, you know, this is generally the individuals that they would say we don't want to give PD to, and we would like you to just continue forward with your court case. Um, so, you know, we, we covered a lot of territory here in, in, our, in our talk here, and I hope this makes sense. Now, it, it might be a little complicated, but let's just say, let's recap it. If you are in immigration court and now you're married to an American US citizen and you're like, I wanna file an I-130 um, and I'll get out of court so I can do the rest of the process in USCIS. This is great for you. If you are an individual who has TPS pending for Venezuela, Haiti, maybe you've got actually, um, or, or Afghanistan or Ukraine or what have you. And, and maybe you already have it, maybe it's just pending. Maybe it's not even approved you could be a really good candidate for dismissing a case. You have another form of relief. Um, if you um, you have ties to the U.S. and you have an asylum pending, but you're 
you'd rather just get out of court um, and, and maybe wait for someone to petition for you in the future and you're fine with that, um, you know, this, this could be for you as well. So this is a, an opportunity that you can get out yourself out of immigration court by following this memo. Now, although it just came out this week and uh, it's going to go into forks in effect later at the 25th of April, this is something to get started for. And as we said in the beginning, you don't want to wait till the last minute to apply for your PD request. So you can learn uh, more about us, follow us um, at Ruby Powers Law um, on lots of different places. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Um, we also do uh, live updates on Tuesday about what's going on in the news. And we're doing these weekly webinars on Wednesdays um, to help give you an update of what's going on. You can also find us on TikTok at Powers Immigration Lawyer. We have lots of fun videos and informative as well. Um, and we tried to put a lot of our late breaking videos there. Um, and there was a lot of news this last week, but you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, uh, TikTok, and we also give out a, a newsletter every every other week in Spanish and English that summarizes the news for the that time period. Um, and so our topics for the rest of April. So thanks for joining us today for our first one of April. Uh, our alternatives to the H one B visa. Um, on the 13th, the 20th is does immigration check your social media and the 27th debunking immigration myths. So, um, you know, that'll be fun. Um, <laughs> so if you enjoyed our, you know, like share, watch, uh, link, uh, get connected with us on other social media. And if you have a topic you'd like us to cover, just, just let us know on, on any of our social media and, and we'll prepare it or we're currently putting together our, our May and June topics. Um, but we're glad you joined us today. And if you want to hear more, reach out to us. We're Powers Law Group. Um, and you can find us on all the social media, including rubypowerslaw.com and call, call us at 713-589-2085. Thanks so much. Have a great day.